everyone. I'm Reba Magulik, the senior founding partner of the D8 Group, and thank you for joining us on our show today, A New Way to Win. The D8 Group was founded to help organizations and private businesses better understand the federal acquisition process, find the ideal fit opportunities in government contracting that they should be pursuing, and also allowing them to leverage our firm's business development resources to strategically and ethically position for win. Our show, A New Way to Win, chronicles priorities in federal government agencies and hot topics within the federal contracting industry today. Our goal is to provide a platform for meaningful engagement and dialogue between government leaders and federal contracting industry. So today, we're super excited to welcome a dear friend and respected colleague, Teresa Holder, to the studio. Hi, Teresa. Hi. <laughs> now, before we start, I want to share some fun facts about you. Teresa is the Vice President of the Veterans Affairs and Military Health Strategy Engagement for OptumServe. She was voted Washington Executive's Top 10 Healthcare Leaders to Watch. And she's had meteoric rise in the growth executive role in the federal health IT community. She's led growth for Lidos, Lockheed Martin, SAIC, and of course, OptumServe in her career. And her personal passion is around America's veterans. She is on the board of directors for America's Warrior Partnership. So uh, with that, let's welcome you again, Teresa. You are clearly keeping yourself very busy. <laughs> A little bit. To say the least, right? <laughs> But thank you for joining us. I have a couple of questions for you. Sure. So um, why don't we start? Can you talk a little bit about what is it about the veteran and military health missions that appear to drive you personally? So it's actually funny. I feel like in my career, I've grown up in and around the military community. We were fortunate enough to spend 10 years overseas ingrained in the military community. Mm -hmm. um, and so after that time, it really gave me a new appreciation for the strength and struggle of the military and the veteran community and really helped me connect. So I, I really feel like that compassionate understanding that the military community invites you in. There's no place like that. Are there examples that you can share of things that really particularly pulled at your heartstrings? Um, I really, when family gets sick and you're overseas and people come and help you and when we had children, uh, the entire military community came over and made sure we were really well taken care of. My husband, in fact, had to go back to the United States when my son was two weeks old, which in the military community seems like I had an extraordinary amount of time with my son um, and my husband, but the entire community came over during those two weeks and made sure that we were well taken care of. and. Mm -hmm that we had folks coming in to make sure that I had what I needed and he did too. That's remarkable. What are the, um, you're on this advisory board, what, um, or board of directors rather, what, what are some of the main ways that you like to give back? So, um, you know, it's funny because I think it really varies. So it depends on what your accessibility is, right? So my, so what is your superpower? What is the thing that you can bring to the board that other folks can't? So mm -hmm. some of that is, uh, from a marketing perspective, some of it is helping create the connections from a sponsorship perspective, and some of it's helping to build the business in a way that can help them be profitable enough to be impactful to veterans' lives, mm -hmm. right? So, um, you know, on the Paralyzed Veterans of America, I've been on that board for their gala for many mm -hmm. years and helped to raise multi-million dollars. In fact, since we've come back to America, there's never been an organization that I worked for that wasn't the top sponsor of their gala. Wow. Um, and so way to go, Teresa. <laughs> but I sometimes, see a common thread there. <laughs> but sometimes <laughs> that really is very specific, right? Not everyone is going to come into a board and have that same mm -hmm. superpower, right? There are tons of people have this superpower that they know a ton of people in different spaces and can make connections in a different way. Right. Yeah. So I think it's recognizing what is your superpower? Where can you be most impactful? I love that. And thank you for all the work that you've done. It is very well recognized in the community. It truly is. Um, so in your role as vice president of veteran and military health strategy, um, how would you say your focus differs from your peer executives who are covering the health and human services um, account, particularly CMS or some of the other operational divisions? I think, 
just to use that one word, impactful, I think one of the biggest things that you can see from a VA and military health space is you can see how immediately impactful you are when you have a new contract. Like as an example, we have the community care contract. We're connecting that next level of care in partnership with the VA. Mm -hmm. And so getting that increased access to care changes lives immediately. And so I think that's one of the things that is most different is that you can immediately see that impact. Whereas with SSA or with CMS, mm -hmm. you know, you don't necessarily always see your constituents or, you know, the end benefit mm -hmm. user of the spaces that you're in and where you've grown the business. And so I think that that's one of the things that I probably most enjoy, mm -hmm. but I also probably think that's most different between those two agencies or those organizations. Interesting. Um, you have had tremendous success in your career. You worked with virtually all of the top systems integrators. Um, and now you are in an executive level role at Optum pretty quickly, I'd say. Um, it's been a very fast, like I said, meteoric rise. Uh, there are a lot of us in that corporate jungle. We're all kind of squirrel trying to get that nut. Um, what advice do you have for executives like what you know as you look back on your career and the things that you did right what advice could you share for other executives that are also charged with growth in their organizations i think two things that i would say the one that's probably most important is knowing who you are and know what you know mm -hmm. there are going to be people in your career that are going to tell you hey you should do it this way you should do it this way but mm -hmm. if you know something's the right way to do it You'll find that and, and hold on to that because there will be people from different positions and being able to argue why, why it's the right decision is really important. Mm -hmm. But also afterwards, you'll know you did the right thing if you're not taking the influence by all these other folks that are coming in. There's tons of people with phenomenal ideas mm -hmm. and you should listen to them. But at the end of the day, it's you making those correct decisions. And so you always have to kind of know who you are, right. know that you're doing the right decisions, making the right decisions for the right things. And then the second thing I would say would really be be person, be personable, be who mm -hmm. you are. So I think it's actually probably generational. But when you think back when you first started your career, you think about those folks that were very stoic and you oh, never yeah. knew, did they have children? Were they passionate? Right. Those, you only saw the passionate when you did something wrong, right? <laughs> um, and so, <laughs> so I, will, I will go back to one, one of the great leaders that we have in Optum right now, which is Patty Horaho. Mm -hmm. She is an extraordinary leader, but she is so personal. She mm -hmm. makes you understand the need and the why behind why you're there. Mm -hmm. And Part of that is what makes her such a great leader because you can go to her when things are going well, but you can also go to her when things aren't going well. And mm -hmm. so I think when you become so stoic, people don't want to tell you, hey, there's a challenge over here. Right. And so I think staying who you are, be personal, mm -hmm. be who you are. Right. A and that, I think, is the biggest differentiator for most people is mm -hmm. just always just be you. Reba, you are always you. <laughs> yeah. I try. <laughs> yeah. that, I mean, that really, truly is. I think one of the biggest things that makes a difference. It does. I mean, I would agree. It's like when you are approaching a customer, um, your passion comes through, right? So, you know, you approaching a client uh, or a government individual, trying to understand their mission, the empathy that you show uh, comes across. Yep. And if you're being yourself and it's just more authentic that way. And it's funny, you send someone else in trying to do the exact same thing. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times, and I know you faced this too in my career, where yeah. people have said, oh, you'll never get them to talk to you. You will never get that information out of them. <laughs> but, you know, it's not some sneaky method of trying to uh, get it, uh, extract information. It's just getting people to drop their walls, if you will. And I, and I do think that your point there is very solid. Yeah, it's the curiosity, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're truly curious about how you can help someone, mm -hmm. that genuine that genuine empathy is never going to go away, right? Mm -hmm. And if they see you at the grocery store or in a meeting room, you're right. still the same person. Right, right. And so just be who you are, right? Like, I agree. I agree. What about other, like, um, maybe more some, some more tactical examples? You know, um, you're picturing maybe the mid-level uh, executive in growth and business development that is trying to be noticed or get to that next level, being personable, thousand percent uh, very very good advice but are there other things that you would say hey be aware of this or um, make sure you do this as you're trying to uh, 
get your deals noticed and you know so on and so forth it's funny i think there's probably two things read everything okay every single thing mm -hmm. read everything that you can possibly read be curious mm -hmm. so not just the document that came out by the government mm -hmm. but also the documents that came out from other people commenting on that document mm -hmm. all, any any other industry that relates to that read all of that oh yes because the more educated you are in that space the more valuable you are to your customer to your organization and to you mm -hmm. and the more it's going to change you and grow you as you grow into the next role right right and then i would say build partnerships not just with the people that are in the space that Good you're one. in yeah um but the people that are in the finance organization and the contracts organization mm -hmm. because it helps you also understand what, what's impacting them about the deal you're bringing in. Right, right. Right. And the same thing from a government perspective and your customers, right? Mm -hmm. They Like you want to know how it's going to impact them if you bring this in and help them with this phenomenal problem that, problem that they have, mm -hmm. that you helping them get to that next level or solve that problem and how it impacts, that's phenomenally important. So the curiosity and building partnerships in not just one space but all of them, mm -hmm. that I think is definitely makes you a big different get makes you stand out oh yeah I like what you said about read everything because you know one of the things that we always say when I'm speaking with clients you know about our methodology I'm like it's art plus science and it's really easy a lot of us have you know these fabulous personalities we can go out there and talk and open doors but if you haven't done the homework up front it's a squandered opportunity and that I agree with you it's such a differentiator because a lot of people don't want to put in the hard work that's required yeah. So um, what are some common uh, mistakes that you've seen executives make both in their career life and their personal life as they're trying to climb this ladder, for lack of a better, better term? I really think that that stoic aspect of things. Mm -hmm. Right. So you'll see um, a leader who has become so stoic. That, I mean, that, just as I mentioned, being so stoic mm -hmm. that the people around you and that the people that you're leading don't feel like they can come to you and talk to you and say hey you know what we have this problem how can you help right I mean I think that's a huge thing so becoming so stoic mm -hmm. that people feel like hey, you know what that person's way high up here I can never talk mm -hmm. to them never have a conversation and those are the most valuable conversations that you I was can gonna have. say what a it's shame because you're not able to leverage any of that person's experience and wisdoms and do's and don'ts that they've acquired through the course of their career yeah, and, and those are the people that are on the front line that see mm -hmm. the most impact of, you know, from a customer perspective or delivery or all of those pieces. Mm -hmm. They're literally sitting there seeing that every single day. And so if they don't feel like they can talk to you, mm -hmm. how do you get the information from them? Right, right. What about on the personal front? And again, we're talking about um, a person that's trying to uh, climb that ladder, succeed, show success, you know, hit growth targets. Uh, move their organization forward um, you know there's some common mistakes that you identified that they make in the workplace do you see them making uh, mistakes in their personal choices I think I've made those mistakes <laughs> I, I really do we I all think, have, right <laughs> I think the biggest mistake is working too much and not remembering mm -hmm. that all of those other things are actually why you do that, right? Right, right. Um, so I have to check myself. Have mm -hmm. I spent enough time with my husband? Have I spent enough time with my kids? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's my mistake, right? So th that's the one thing that I think I make, and I'm sure that others can, <laughs> can relate to that. Oh, absolutely. Yes, yeah. we've all been there, but it is about prioritizing, and I, and I hear you saying that. That's good to check yourself and say, hey, am I taking care of the things that really matter in life? Yep. Um, so... Uh, we're hearing daily tragedies, tragic stories around the opioid crisis. How are you seeing this epidemic specifically affect veterans? And what are some of the latest strategies on combating this from the industry side? Because we obviously hear a lot from government. You know, sat in the audience, heard a lot of different folks from the government speak on this issue. But what, what's your take on it, Teresa? So the first part of the veteran's life, I think um, most folks may or may not know that a veteran is twice as likely to overdose when they're misusing opioids. Um, and so actually the VA has been really phenomenal. And it's it, the VA is a really large ship. I think most folks underappreciate 
how large of an organization it is and how it how difficult it is to get them moving in one way or another mm -hmm. really quickly. But they've done a phenomenal job in creating the opioid safety initiative. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really to recognize, you know, a lot of what industry is doing right now, connecting all the pieces, right? Mm -hmm. Not just the pharmacy, not just the healthcare organization, the community, the person that's helping take care of that veteran. Right. Um, so I think that that's the o opioid safety initiative is phenomenal with the VA right now. They're, they're doing a phenomenal job in, in addressing that. And then from an industry perspective, um, I, I will say for us, we are connecting all those pieces, right? And not mm -hmm. just connecting them from a... Um, Making sure that the healthcare provider in the pharmacy is talking, but mm -hmm. also making it easy for them to talk um, and making it so that the caregiver can take uh, a little bit more control and help in getting setting things on the right path. And then I would say my personal perspective on that, you know, as many opioid conversations as I've sat in mm -hmm. over the years, some of that also is, you know, level setting on pain. Right. If if you have back surgery, you might have some pain afterwards. Right. It's going to be pretty painful. Yeah. And I think uh, in America, we have a tendency to say, how can we completely get rid of that pain for you? Uh. Where our European partners might say, hey, it's going to be really painful. And so we're going to really help you along the way. But so I think it's probably a little bit of a really strong conversation, mm -hmm. but also really connecting those dots. Right. Not just the pharmacy, mm -hmm. not just the pharmacist. But the healthcare provider, the caretaker, mm -hmm. the person themselves, and then having those very frank conversations of how is your pain management? How can we get it better? Because sometimes people think it's going to be an opioid, but maybe it's not. Actually, right, right. That's fascinating. Yeah, because truly, people have different levels of uh, pain tolerance, is my understanding. So why over medicate somebody that maybe would have been okay? Yeah, I mean, I've had four kids, so I can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> like, my, my, my pain threshold is phenomenal. <laughs> Both emotionally and physically, right? <laughs> At 100%. As a mom of three, I can relate. <laughs> so actually, that leads me into my last question for you. This is more on the personal side. So, I mean, you're just a superstar, Teresa. I'm a big fan. Um, I, um, I mean, we've already gone over some of the major bullet points in your career, how you do it all. I think our audience would be fascinated to know that you've done this, like you said, with four children. <laughs> and you've been a wife of 15 years, married to another superstar in the industry, by the way, I might add. So you got, you know, super mom and super dad together um, having these amazing career tra trajectories. But you're raising four children. And, you know, we're personal friends. I know you're doing a great job with it. And the kids <laughs> are very happy. So um, how do you make time to advance your career, focus on your marriage and on motherhood? Community, I, like we are very blessed. Uh, my father-in-law lives with us. It is really it, my sister-in-law. And you helps say that you're blessed. <laughs> we are, we really no, I think that's really great are. because they're, I mean, see, that's half the. That's a great oh. attitude. I mean, there are people out there that might have a different perspective on that. But 100 percent, that is a blessing. Yes, and I will say also one of the other ways that we've sort of helped to grow our family, helped mm -hmm. to grow our careers, and done it all at the same time is that some of that, there's times where I can ingrain my children in what we're doing, whether mm -hmm. it's a veteran outreach program and I bring them along with me, mm -hmm. or whether it's, you know, we have to go to a gala and my children get ready with us, right? So Aww, so that's part that's of cute. the fun too. Um, but, but really, we're really blessed. It's like we have a ton mm -hmm. of family in the area. We have a lot of friends and a lot of community and my kids have lots of friends. And so I think that that really is the biggest way. But I think the other aspect of that is sort of connecting the dots for my kids that what do you mean? mommy can be a career driven person, mm -hmm. but also a mommy. Right. And so that's the other reason why we try to bring our kids along with us when it's when it's appropriate. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so that they can see that. And so they can see how impactful that business is. And then they're like, right. whoa, hey, mom really needs to be out here doing this. Yes, this is important. It's impacting so many people. Oh, totally. That's yeah. fabulous. Um, how do you make time for yourself? With a big community, that I big actually, old community around. <laughs> I, sometimes or I do have, you make I time schedule. for yourself? Yeah, I'm not very good at that, <laughs> but I do sometimes schedule it. Okay. Um, and That's then a my, good strategy. Then Ray will force me to, right? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Ray's Mr. Holder. Good, good guy, great yes. husband. Um, is there any friendly competition between you and your mister? 
given that he's also a rising superstar in the industry? I don't know if I would ever say our competition is friendly. <laughs> it is You're so honest. Always. I love that. <laughs> Competitors, so you yeah, get it. You either you the rules win or your second best loser. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. No, no, we're both. I think actually, he he was an athlete for a really long time, and so mm -hmm. he's really competitive. I, but it's so funny because I think I am just smidgen more competitive than he is. <laughs> Race to the top of the stairs. Who brushes their teeth the best? <laughs> That is hilarious, but yeah. I think that's so cute that you have that and yet you have this beautiful relationship and you've got these beautiful children and really you're it's a very well-rounded uh, life and you're giving back to the community. Similar to you, Rita. <laughs> Thank you, Teresa. I appreciate that. Thank you again, everyone who's been listening in and we welcome you back next time on A New Way to Win.